Hello there. This is a new section, actually, it's a one-off time section called Movie Week. The reason why Movie Week is coming apart because there aren't many films that are actually out this week that many people care for me to review. So I'm actually going to make it even more pointless by accumulating all the films I've been seeing. That includes no films that anyone went and saw. So we'll do it from Friday the 1st of July, the day I actually got off on my summer holidays. Yes, I only get six weeks and then all the way up to the 8th of July, which is the Friday. So we shall start on the Friday. I went and saw Transformers 3, which is a mind-numbingly, stupendously stupid film, which has no redeeming qualities, in all honesty. I did a very overly long review for a very overly long film, which was boring, tedious, and shockingly stupid. Uh, I didn't like it one bit. I know a lot of people have been saying, hey, it's a good Michael Bay film, but hey, I will say this. If you enjoy Transformers 3, Watch it when it comes out on DVD and tell me the point where you start ripping your eyeballs out. On Saturday I went and saw something that was able to cleanse my palate of what I saw on Friday and that was a film called Love Like Poison. Love Like Poison is to do with the character of Anna who returns from boarding school in France to actually learn that her family has been torn apart basically. Love Like Poison I went in with sort of the same feeling as of Gods and Men. It was a film that was about monks, it was had you know, religious allegorical tones to it. I wasn't all that looking forward to Of Gods and Men, but as many know, Of Gods and Men was one of my favourites of last year. And I went in with the same feeling of Love Like Poison, and it just about came out as one of my favourites of the year as well. There are two reasons why I like Love Like Poison quite a lot, and genuinely think it's one of the better films of this year. Love Like Poison creates its story as sort of like a mystery of why these people are falling apart, because it's only in sparse moments where we actually see the huge outbursts of anger that this mother and father feel towards each other. But there's adequate tension between all the characters. There's the relationship between the mother and daughter, which doesn't seem to be quite right. It's uneasy, but at times it kind of works. And she respects the daughter, but at times she can't understand the daughter. It's the same kind of feeling the daughter feels towards the mother at times. The other reason I like it is because it's centering around a theme I big fan of in films called Innocence. Yes, Innocence is a fun theme to me. And it's mostly innocence being lost from childhood and learning about the real adult world and seeing how that plays out in films really interesting to me because some of my favourite films are to do with that. And the film does it in a really uh, religiously toned and entertaining way where we find out her views on uh, first love, sex, death. It's uh, a really interesting film on that theme that I'm really interested in. It's beautiful, it's kind of bizarre at times, and uh, really mysterious and really dark and really disturbing in parts. The things they get away with in this film, the Daily Mail would be getting in a, a pretty much a kerfuffle over. They would be getting in an uproar if they saw this film. Of course the Daily Mail are narrow-minded, so they never saw this film. So Love Like Poison, highly recommend it and I generally believe it's one of the better films of this year. On Sunday, yes, I keep on going, I went and saw a re-release of Akira. Akira is the famous manga film from the 1980s which everyone seems to love and call a classic. And it is, in some respects, because it's a film that influenced so many films coming after it, which is most prominently The Matrix. When I came out of the film, I said to the person I was with that that's a really good like science fiction blockbuster, but it's not. And you would think that because this film influenced so many films coming after it that you'd think, yeah, this would be the norm by now, but watching this film, it's still relevant today, it still works, it still feels fresh. And that's something that uh, really worries me, that uh, this film, 20 odd years old, uh, still feels fresh, and yet everything that comes out nowadays feels dated. But everything kind of works with the Kira. It's a really fresh, really original film. It's got socio-political messages, it's got ideas about revolution and state government, state controlling over the people, and the animation still looks as good as ever and it still holds up to this very day, which I think is mostly what I like about 2D animation is it's very detailed and you just don't get that in any Pixar film, I think, nowadays. So it's a, you know, a real shame that this type of animation is sort of dying out and Studio Ghibli seem to be the only company that do this. By the end, the thing that troubles me about Akira is that it's a film that doesn't know when to end, and there's a point where it could have ended and it just continues on and continues on, and you think, when are you going to end? And when it does end, it doesn't know how to end. It's a film in search of an ending, and when it gets there, it doesn't know how. So good, I might like to see the film again, but if anything, Akira has gotten me more interested in seeing films like this. On Monday, I went and did a double bill of films that had just come back into the cinema 
and some new releases. So we shall start with Kaboom. Kaboom is this sort of funny and quirky little uh, lynching comedy. It's not made by Lynch, but it's very surreal. And it's all to do with the, the college life of a college student who is either bisexual, gay, straight, a bit confused there. And he's going through the norms of life through college. He's experiencing new things. And he's experiencing sex, witches, the end of the world, cults, all the normal things until the world goes kaboom. Kaboom I found to be, if you take it as a comedy, uh, I laughed, you know, about two thirds of the way through. Most of the time I found the film to be very funny, so as a comedy it succeeds. As a really weird movie, it succeeds for about two thirds of the way. Because here's my experience with Kaboom. It's an unconventional film, then a very funny film, then a bit weird, then an unconventional film, then a bit weird, quirky, funny, unconventional, then conventional, 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 you're not being very funny, end thing is with Kaboom it stops all the things that it's worked really well on and then just becomes really conventional, ties up loose ends and it ends. It's a bit of a shame because everything up to there I really enjoyed. When I was away on exam leave like everyone else I missed a bunch of films which is really annoying. I missed Pinya 3D which I was really looking forward to, the Wim Wenders film, Attack the Block, Joe Cornish film which Robbie Collin hates but Robbie Collin's an idiot and then we have 13 Assassin the Takeshi Miki film. One of those films came back in. Oh yes, 13 Assassins came back into my cinema. 13 Assassins is by Takeshi Miike, so you would expect it to be quite violent, quite shocking, but oh no, he understands that his sense of humour and sense of violence might just not work for a 13 Assassins or a samurai film in general, so he takes a completely different approach. This is one of the best samurai films I've probably ever seen, and at the same time, it's probably the most authentic and traditional I've seen in a long time. And everyone's been talking about the two sections of this film. The first half very slow, blah 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 blah, and then the second is a huge massive battle fest. Well I found the two sections just to be as equally entertaining. We've got one society and ideology who think that it's a right to be killing and uh, slaughtering all the people. And then you've got the other ideology, these 13 assassins, and they believe that it's not right for this man, this really fierce dictator to be doing this anymore. So you've got all that adequate tension between the two sides that are just boiling up to that massive action scene. And the thing is about 13 Assassins is it never drags. It's sophisticated, funny and humorous and delightful and violent and engrossing and entertaining in ways I didn't expect it to. So I would have to say that for me, it's the only film I've come out this year fully knowing of what my opinion is on it and that it's absolutely perfect. It's my favourite film of this year, no doubt. On Tuesday I also went and saw two films, a double bill of two new releases. I went and saw How I Ended This Summer. How I Ended This Summer is about brotherly bonds, basically, about uh, these two people, two men, who are on the Arctic Circle and they're from Russia. And they have to check the radiation meters. <laughs> I know this is sounding really, really entertaining here. And they have to do this every few hours and they go and check it and blah, 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 blah. And one of them goes away fishing and then one of them gets a phone call. And this phone call is quite, it's just a twist turner, shall we say. And once this person gets this phone call, he wants to tell the person the truth of what that person said to him on the phone, but he's trying to avoid him at the same time because he knows if he tells him something, it's going to bubble up to the surface. For me, how I ended the summer, for the first 40 minutes of the film, it's really tedious. As I said, it is about two Russians checking the meteor for radiation, that's it. And through those 40 minutes, yes, there are moments which are entertaining. The beginning has a really great soundtrack to it. And then you've got the uh, idea of humor between these two, which is really entertaining and really nice. But then you've got these moments where it's just tedious and they're repeating and it's minimalist. And I'm going, hurry up, when is this picking up? Once he gets that phone call though, the film completely changes and it becomes entirely engrossing, really gripping and really tense throughout. And that's the type of, uh, I guess, film I didn't expect it to be because I knew nothing about it. And to continue on on Tuesday, I went and saw the documentary Life in a Day. Yes, I went and saw the documentary which is made by you. For me, Life in a Day was a documentary which was basically showing you how much human spirit is lacking in cinema and how this film is showing you what you can do with that. 
it's a really uh, well done film, seeming the amount of footage they got and how well it actually comes out and how professional it looks, it's not something that you would expect. However, Life in a Day is shamefully manipulative at times, and I would say you have 4,500 hours of footage. This could have been a very different film, and I wonder if it could have been a better film if there would be more footage, but I do trust their judgement. And I can understand that you're trying to show different facets of emotion through one day, through different stories that are sent to you. But I just had this nagging feeling that what Life in the Day the team did with uh, Ridley Scott and Kevin McDonald and Tony Scott, that they just took images and uh, clips that they had the most of for that day. So there's brushing your teeth, there's getting up, there's looking at the clock, there's having lunch, there's... However, there are these really interesting stories throughout of uh, people who don't see their family very often, there's uh, wedding... Uh, wedding rehearsals and uh, renewing your vows which are really funny and then you've got these incredible stories like one is a cyclist who's been cycling around the world for nine years to try and uh, stop the divide between South and North Korea. I found that to be a really incredible story. By the end I would say that life in a day will make you feel nice and happy coming out of the film even when it is very sad at times, very dark. On Wednesday, yes, I'm still continuing, I went and saw Norwegian Wood. Norwegian Wood was a film that also came back into the cinema since I missed it because of prelims, which were fun. But the main reason why I never saw Norwegian Wood when it actually did originally come out was because I was finishing off the book by uh, Murakami. So with Norwegian Wood, you have all your favourite characters coming back. You have Watanabe, you have Midori, and briefly, even though it's so wrong that it's so brief, you have Stormtrooper. Here's what I would do with Norwegian Wood. Uh, as the book goes, it's amazing. It's a great book and everyone should read it. How would I recommend the film? I'd recommend it to people who've read the book to see how you think it's adapted and how well you think it's brought up on screen. I would wholeheartedly, though, recommend it to people who have never read the book and you're just seeing the film for the first time because it's going to be a much more entertaining experience for you than it was for me. I would say this, for a film that's two and a half hours, it never felt like two and a half hours. That's a plus point. For me, I never got to know the characters well enough to get invested in them, and nor did I feel that, even though the film isn't doesn't feel very long, I did feel the film was very rushed because it lacks something that made the film, made the film, the film didn't work, made the book work so well. With this adaptation it lacks the narrative uh, complications, it lacks the character complications that were in the book and made the book so compelling. So it's lacking completely. I didn't really like Norwegian Wood that much. On Thursday I went and saw the Academy Award nominated foreign language film Incendies. Incendies centers around two siblings, twins, who are given two letters from their mother which says you have to go and find and send this to your father who they thought was dead and you'll also have to go and find and give this letter to your brother who they never knew they had. And that's all I'm going to say, because with Incendies I went in only knowing that it was an Academy Award nominated film and it had a lot of hype. That was it. I didn't know the story, I didn't see the trailer, so I'm going to say very little else about it so you can hopefully have the same experience as I did. Incendies never says where it's actually from, but you can tell it is from Lebanon. And there's a film called Lebanon, which I didn't really like at all, down to the fact that it's a film that was just a technical exercise, which was about the Lebanon War. But Incendies is never a technical exercise, and it is about the Lebanon War, and it successfully is able to talk about it without actually being a war film. Where the war film actually takes part is the actual war that is between the, uh, the mother's past and uh, between the family, which is really gripping and really entertaining and really engrossing. It is like a really good solid thriller that we haven't seen in a long time. And even though parts of this film, which I will not say, are not new, there is the idea of blood for blood, but uh, you know, you don't have a director who's able to pull off even ridiculous parts with this much uh, confidence, and you don't have as good performance as any thriller you'll see all year. And on Friday, I went and saw Oh yes, this is the very big one. This is The Tree of Life. Tree of Life is like a huge, big, long-awaited blockbuster for years and everyone's been looking forward to it. And when I came out of uh, Tree of Life, I said it's pretty damn arresting stuff. It's an amazing film to watch. That doesn't mean it's an amazing film all the way, but I would say this. Malik's film is like a one huge teaser trailer and I'm just summing up the film very quickly. The film is like one huge long teaser trailer the first time you see it and then the second time you see it it's like the full length trailer and you'll get more about it and then the second time, actually the third time, and the third time 
it's the full movie. But what I would say is the film tackles so many themes on the first time. It's about the afterlife, the beginning of Earth, the death, life, growing up, being a child, being Malik in general, the famous Ortor who can only, he's one of the only who can actually be called that. Uh, he never gives interviews, but this kind of feels like the film that encapsulates everything that he hasn't said before. And whatever you think of this film, a good film, a bad film, it's a memorable film. And I think that's something that you don't get to say very often. You don't get to say very often as well that you've seen nothing ever quite like it. Thank you for watching. Uh, it's a long video, I know I've done another one. And I would just like to say, uh, if you would like to comment on these films, if you've seen any of them, let me know. So. I got nothing else. Bye bye.